Wow, uh, that was a beautiful introduction, Jim. Uh, <laughs> I have a heavy heart today. And for reasons that uh, I will share with you. Um, but I want us to think about how beautiful it is today. And that this could be the day that we decide to change the world. I just visited the Grand Canyon for the first time. It's a funny thing, the Grand Canyon. You encounter the real world on a scale that is simply not available to us anywhere else. The Grand Canyon is what Kant called the space of the sublime. It's where you encounter something bigger than you can think. And it's in that encounter that we become human. In the encounter with something bigger than ourselves. So, what Jeff didn't tell you is that I have a long history and so I was drawn to the Tyler Clemente story because uh, when I was a freshman in college, uh, there was a woman in all of my classes, and one night she asked me to go out for drinks with her. Uh, but I was a very abstemious young man at that point, and I said I had to go study. So I told her I had to go study, like a good student. And she went back to her room and killed herself. Now, when people <clears throat> commit suicide, they leave a lasting lesson for those of us who survive. Why did I write about Tyler Clemente? Uh, because I know Tyler has influenced people in ways people don't even know yet. Tyler will be with many of the students here for the rest of their lives. So, how do we honor that? So I wrote about, uh, started writing about Tyler as soon as the story broke. I did that because my personal life has also been touched by suicide and that my father attempted to kill himself twice after he turned 55. I'm also uh, a father and I have a gay teenage daughter and I have a very strong sense of how difficult the world is for gay kings. As I studied the story of what happened in the few short hours between Tyler's discovery that he had been spied on and his trip to the Washington Bridge, one of the facts that stuck out to me the most from this event was that in these tweets that went out about this event, there were 148 followers. And not one of them said no. Not one of them said stop. And when the trial came and I followed it in the news, I came to see that one of those students was a student who had studied with me. Jeff has asked us to think about what makes moral people. But I think it's important for us to continue to believe that the function of higher education is to help produce moral people. Where does this come from, these kids? 
just the kids, right? It's not just the kids. If we ask who are the moral sources in the lives of the young, and we watch the news, we can simply entertain ourselves with who's going to be the person this week who photographed some part of themselves and put it on the web thinking nobody would know. What we have done in the effort to simplify this problem is to think about this as a problem with technology. Instead of understanding that we're living through the most significant transformation in human communication in human history. It is the responsible of the wise and the elderly. It is their responsibility to create a world where young people can develop the moral compass that Jeff referred to. How did we get here? And where are we? Because we are not in the world I grew up in. We live at a time when information is super abundant. This is unprecedented. People will tell you, oh, it's just a shade of difference. It's a continuity with the past. The internet is just like a bigger uh, Gutenberg press. The people who tell you that are wrong. They are refusing to confront how dramatic the change is that we are living through today. If we do not confront the reality of that problem, then we'll build a center like Jeff talked about. It'll be good for four or five years, it'll have some conferences, and then it will disappear. But this center is founded on the central problem of our time. How will we develop a humane society in the face of the superabundance of information? Information which largely confirms for anyone who wants to look the worst things about humankind. The worst things humans can do to each other is on the web. You can see it. Websites devoted to ex uh, girlfriends' photos being posted by boyfriends. We'll look at uh, another uh, disturbing thing later in the presentation. But I feel that it's essential for us to think about the university as a place that's committed to making a better world. How do we get there? I'm working with a colleague uh, now on a book that's trying to think about how you teach people in a world where when they transition to college, they bring with them all their friends from the past, all their memories, all their photos. Everything's on Facebook. You transition, but you're not actually not where you came from. You're still there, and you can get back there as soon as you pull your phone out. How do you travel when your past is always with you? So we've established an assignment in a class in creative nonfiction that begins with the simple prompt that you need to establish that you are interested in something. Anything will do, show us that you're interested. Honestly, this is a response to the assignment from this semester. Honestly, going into this assignment and even watching Jamie Oliver's TED Talk, I was struggling with being interested in anything. I'm a senior graduating in May. I work six days a week and have class three days a week, and I have real-life job interviews regularly on top of it all. This idea of being interested in something that wasn't promoting my future career seemed frivolous and silly. 
Since I started working, it has all been focused on building my resume and securing a good job after I graduate. It wasn't until our professor said to me, you got excited over Michael Pollan, so that could be something. I felt sad in a way that I needed help finding something I was really interested in enough to research at length and come to questions not easily answered. We need to think not only about the transition to college, but the transition from college. The world that our students are graduating into is also a world that those of us who are over 25 don't know about. A world where employment is uncertain, uh, crushing debt is a given. How do you become interested in anything? My conviction is that this is not a moral failing or a mental failing of this particular student, but that this student is representative of a society that has defined education as the process of taking tests. What does it mean to know something? Color in this right circle. What does it mean to write an essay? Produce one that can be graded by a machine. And then we're shocked that our students have no moral imagination, that they struggle with empathy, that they think only of themselves. How do you teach people how to be interested? What's the scarcest resource in education today? And it's not what you think, even at Rutgers. <laughs> So if we take money off the table, what is it? Hmm? Time. That's a good one. And without time, what you can't do is focus. There are people in here who certainly have, ch have checked their email already while I've been talking. They've checked their Twitter feeds, they've checked their Facebook, they may have tweeted. How do you get people's attention at a time when we've created devices that say the second you're bored, you're, we can liberate you from your boredom? One of the things I tell my students is you need to cultivate the art of being bored. When you're bored, you might finally figure out something about yourself. We've created a society that prevents boredom and allows people to remain in constant contact. And what you get when you combine information superabundance and a loss of focus is, if you follow Nick Carr, uh, who wrote a book called The Shallows, but some of you may know him through his article, uh, Is Google Making Us <coughs> Stupid? And I think you know the answer to that from Nick Carr's perspective. And so The Shallows is essentially an expanded version of that article. And it argues that in the age of superabundance, what you get is shallowness. That Google is to blame for the fact that we are shallow now. On the other side of this fight over the significance of technology, we have uh, Clay Shirky who argues that, in fact, what the Internet has done is it has made it possible for humans to, in the past 20 years, accomplish the two greatest acts of human collaboration in human history. The Internet has made it possible for us to map the human genome, and it's made it possible for us to create the greatest encyclopedia in the history of humankind, Wikipedia. So the internet can produce great things, but what happens instead, and the threat that Clay Shirky says stands before us, is that we're in fact going to use the internet to create a perpetual high school. LOL cats high. <laughs> Which is funny, right? I mean, I love these cats. And people who are friends of mine on Facebook know I put a pope on, a cat pope. I mean, I, I love this stuff. Who doesn't? It's hilarious. 
But when the central discourse, the main discourse, the dominant discourse of the internet is humor and parody, are we providing a mental culture that makes it possible for people to become moral beings? To become creative beings, to willingly engage with the problems of our time, which are bigger than any one of us can conceive and bigger than any one of us, or one school, or one department, or one nation can solve. How do we get beyond LOL cats high? How did we get here? I will give you a very simple way of understanding the magnitude of this paradigm shift. I invite you to think about it in the days to come because it is too easy to dismiss the significance of this change. The shift from a paper-based culture to a screen-based culture has changed the very nature of human culture. Everything about what it means to be a thinker and a writer in the academy has been changed by the internet. When I wrote my book, uh, when, uh, uh, Jeff had such nice things to say about, it took me six years to write it, a year for it to be published, six years for it to be reviewed once, two years for it to end up in Amazon's used section for a dollar forty-seven. <laughs> Never used, never opened. This is the story of academic production. Slow and not centrally significant. We have an opportunity at the university to dramatically change the quality of intellectual life, not only in our country, but globally. But it will take courage. And courage is something that's uh, lacking nationally on issues of education. The two um, areas I want you to think about in particular for today is that when information was scarce, when it was paper-based, you had to go to a brick-and-mortar institution. You had to physically be there because that's where the books were. That's where the professors were. And what you got there was content. The content was only available at that place. Now, information is absolutely ubiquitous. Where is the best Shakespeare scholar? It could be in this room. We have a very good one. But the best Shakespeare scholar is no longer a person. I learned this when my daughter was doing her uh, Shakespeare work in 10th grade, and she had to do a soliloquy, and she fell a little bit behind, and she did what kids are doing now when they fall behind. She needed some help with her soliloquy, so where did she go? The internet. And where did she go on the internet? Spark notes. Spark notes, which are fantastic. I don't understand how they produce them. They're incredibly good. <laughs> they are, they're incredibly good. Where else would you go? YouTube. YouTube, of course, right? Suddenly she's got queued up 10 different versions of this soliloquy. And that's before you even start going into a library. How do you compete with that? You can't. That's why Udacity, that's why MOOCs are happening. The sense that you can organize that information for other people and give it away for free is very, very seductive. But that model itself is built on a misunderstanding of how dramatic the change is that we've gone through. The need we have today is not for experts in content. That is not the need. The need for experts in content was because of paper, because information didn't circulate. Now information is everywhere. What we need are people who are resourceful. 
People who say, hey, I just got a tweet that was about something that was seriously fucked up. And I'm going to do something about it. That tweet happens every day. Think of Steubenville. The violence of young people against young people has not stopped in the wake of the atrocity that brings us here today. How are we going to teach people to be resourceful instead of thinking, I need an expert in content, this is really a job for a policeman? How do we get there? We can only get there if we accept this complex, shattering truth. Our students live in a different world than the one we grew up in. And it's our responsibility to learn how to teach in that. Nine years ago, the following online ventures did not exist. And I use nine years for a very particular reason. Nine years is the time it takes to get an average time it takes to get a PhD in the humanities. <laughs> so people are finishing up right now who started dissertations when the most significant forms of publication of the 21st century did not exist. How can those dissertations be in communication with the present moment? How can they be prepared to teach the students we have today? Ted, of all of these, I think has the most important quick bumper sticker solution for all of us to imagine as we go back and think about how we're going to teach, how we're going to advise students, and how, as students, we're going to pursue our education. I tell all my students, look, 300 uh, English majors graduate from Rutgers every year. 300. How are you going to distinguish yourself from those 300 people? When it was a question of content, the degree itself opened doors. We are at a time now where what opens doors is your resourcefulness, your competencies. So you should graduate with an idea worth sharing. Do you have an idea worth sharing? The emphasis at TED is on sharing. It's not on selling. It's not do you have an idea that can get you a million dollars. Because the beauty of the internet in its most utopian ideal form is that it embraces the human desire for community through free exchange. The university should stand for that. And most frequently, we stand against it. Nine years ago, none of the following gizmos. Imagine, no iPhone, no streaming video, no Kindle, no Google Books. Where are the universities that are preparing students to live in that world, to write those books? When I started in this business, I was drawn to it because of my love of writing. And my love of books, I grew up in a house that was overrun with books. I wanted to grow up and write books. I didn't bargain for the fact that history and the economy had no interest in my desires. Now, composing involves all of these things. If you're going to write now, you better know how to work with images, and graphs, and text, and maps, and video, and sound, and animation, and data. Oh, and is that too much? I'm sorry. You better know how to make all of those things, find them, move them around, Share them. Are you overwhelmed? If you're not, you're not paying attention. Okay? The beauty of being a writer is it's you and your thoughts and you're alone with your routine. <coughs> that is not the world anymore. So, as a writing teacher, that's why uh, I'm here. 
I'm interested in the way in which writing, properly understood, is a technology for making meaning of the world. It's not a technology for proving you did the reading. How do you make sense of the world? What will books look like nine years from now? Anybody know what this is? the most amazing book humans have ever produced, and you could have it right now for $3.99 on your smartphone. Delivered to you right now. Uh, I didn't realize what this image was of in this, uh, in the opening chapter. This is a book by Al Gore that's trying to teach us of how to think about the effects of global warming. One of those huge problems that doesn't respond to how many followers you have on Twitter. I've taught this a lot, and then I just gave a talk out in Vegas this weekend, and as the plane was coming in, I was like, oh my god, there it is. That's what this is a picture of. Building a suburb in the desert so that people can gamble. Our choice, that's freedom. But what makes this book amazing is it interrupts you. <laughs> It'll talk to you, it geolocates, it's got images in it, it has archival footage. You can listen to Jimmy Carter say in the 70s that we're at a fork in the road, and if we go down one fork, we will have an energy secure future, and if we go down the other, we will be endangering our children and our children's children. And then you can watch the next clip where Reagan rips those solar panels right off the roof of, roof of the White House with his bare hands. Um, so, it's an amazing book, and you can have it right now on your screen. But, it's going to be the only one of its kind, because Pushpop, the press that made it, was just acquired by Facebook. And as they say, they set out to reimagine the book. The book's not something you write with one person. It's not something you write with a book publishing company. But you write it with a whole series of engineers who know how to make graphs and geolocating information reading devices. A whole host of uh, folks working together to get this book to come out. Um, a book which I do want to stress is not actually very uh, fun to read because it's still a textbook, and so it still hectors you instead of being immersive uh, in ways that uh, young people in particular respond to. But Pushpop says, now we're taking our publishing technology and everything we've learned and are setting off to help design uh, the world's largest book, Facebook. What do you think is going to happen when the hundreds of millions of people who use Facebook start experimenting with this technology. They're going to produce ways of communicating that we cannot imagine. The university should be there. Educators should be there. We should be present and involved in the communication and creation of these new ways of uh, exchanging human understanding. Why is it such a challenge to be interested? I, man, my head's exploding all the time. Why is it so hard to be interested in anything? The problems are too big. Global warming, global economic collapse, global war on terror, internet hopelessness, one of the things, a, a blessing of teaching here, the virtue of being able to work with so many brilliant, excited, uh, courageous young people, is in my two large lecture classes, I teach a class on the apocalypse, which shouldn't surprise you. <laughs> uh, 
and I teach a, a class that follows it on uh, 21st century literature. And I've been doing this uh, for three years now, and I am just overwhelmed every time by the prevailing sense of hopelessness. The sense that we've got to accumulate our credits, but for what? There's a sense that everything's already known. Everybody wants to blame video games, testocracy. Getting started itself is overwhelming. It's not just one of these things. It's all of these things. And if we can't start to think about problems as multivariate, if everything has to reduce, be reduced to pro and con, then you know what we'll get? We'll get the government that we have right now. Incapable of compromise, incapable of understanding problems, incapable of making a better world. But certainly certain of what they're certain of. The university should be providing a model for how we get out of this. The model that I think we need to embrace is that being interested takes practice. It's not a natural skill. That's why you go to school because we all naturally turn away from our own ignorance. No one likes being shown that they don't know things. That's what teachers are for. Being curious takes practice. You have to teach people how to be curious, and you don't actually get there when your writing model is the first words out of your mouth are, what's your thesis? <laughs> really? Let's begin by knowing and then finding the information we pour into it. Can we be surprised at the low quality of our intellectual discussions when that is our model for human understanding? Understanding begins in curiosity. It does not begin in certainty. Being creative takes practice. The university should be a sacred place that advocates and protects that practice. And what we should be cultivating are the habits of the creative mind. Malcolm Gladwell has famously argued, or said the obvious, depending on what your take on Mr. Gladwell is, uh, that any, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert at anything. I've watched my kids go through the public school system and they spent a lot of hours preparing for tests, but they have not spent a lot of hours in school practicing being creative. I want to close with some examples for you of how to think concretely about this, because the problem is solvable. We're in the greatest situation in the world to solve this problem. We're in a university. We're committed to teaching and learning. Uh, we have the resources, we have the community, and we have great students. So how do you get uh, the production of being interested? Because that's the next step in the assignment, be interested. So you can't be interesting if you haven't actually been interested in anything. So um, uh, through the, uh, the luxury of being involved with the Langier Culture Lab, uh, through the English department, I've been able to uh, focus my energies and my research interests on uh, exploring this question of curiosity and creativity in the classroom, and have had a chance to spend semesters with students working on the question of how do you produce something that is actually interesting. Uh, this is a paper uh, from a class uh, my colleague Andrew Esk and I taught last year by a student who came in at the middle of the semester and he said he was really having trouble coming up with the problem or question he was going to work on. We really work against the, the language of topic or thesis. We're interested in having our students think about focusing on a question or a problem, and he, he was struggling. It, the struggle's inevitable. 
the easy thing is the thesis. What's the question? And he came in and he said, you know, I think I was brainwashed over Christmas break. And, you know, that's a good opener, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out he was approached out on Brower Common by a group that said, hey, you want to go to Mexico and teach people English over Christmas break? Do something meaningful with your life? Help people? And this is a good sweet, kind-hearted young man, and he said, absolutely, I, I want to help. And he came back five days, six days, seven days later, and he was going to become a religion major, and he was going to move to Japan. And an article in the New York Times uh, appeared that was about the group that he traveled with, and he discovered that they were, in fact, being discussed and described as a cult. And he went online and he started doing this research project and the question that was driving him was none of us think we can be brainwashed. How did I end up being brainwashed? He went through a great deal of material which, I, which was shown up on the slides here, an incredible archival research because the web stopped being the thing where you find the lolcats and became the place where you can find uh, archives and videos and all sorts of stored information. And he published his paper because we require that all of our students work in public because that's the world we live in. And something happens to writing when it's in public. You stop having to fight about things that are not intellectually rewarding, like the placement of the comma. And you start talking about are you writing about something that matters? This student has now received responses from around the world. Um, you saw how lengthy they are. Um, they're respondents from the group who argue vehemently that they are not a cult. There are people arguing that they are. Uh, I was contacted by a journalist uh, who was doing a, an expose on this group, and she wanted to get in contact with this student. Now that's writing a paper that have found an audience. That's writing something that's important. That's writing something where you begin to see that writing might interact with the world and change the world. It's not a perfect paper, of course it isn't. But I never wrote a paper until I got out of graduate school that anybody read that they weren't paid to read it. <laughs> not counting my mom. <laughs> Uh, another student in my class, uh, our class, Team Talk class, uh, thanks to the support of SAS, uh, were able to team teach this class. And we had a student who was very upset about the coverage of Trayvon Martin. It's like, there's making too much out of race. This has nothing to do with race, which was so. You start with where your students are. Right? Like, that's, not a, that's not an interest, that's not even a question. Start looking into this. And he started to look at how the case was moving around on Twitter, these grotesque uh, misrepresentations and mislabelings of Trayvon Martin. He got access to affidavits and criminal records, all free, all legal, all on the web, if you bother to look. If you decide to do something other than catch the Reddit feed and actually decide that you're going to start thinking. Fantastic piece. He was stunned. And he finishes with a Twitter debate over Hunger Games with all of these young people saying, I gotta admit it really ruined me that they had that kind of dark skinned girl in it. That's the country we live in. We need to confront that. It's not just for undergraduates. I uh, fortunate enough to be able to teach a two week immersive seminar. Some might say it's my own call. Um, six hours a day for two weeks. Um, uh, we take you from uh, what's a computer to post on the web, build a website, load up a YouTube video, cake. All right? There are a billion YouTube videos up there. I got a question for you. How hard can it be? Okay. So we gotta find a way to bump people over 
this sense that I don't want to live in the world that isn't the world of paper anymore and begin to live and work and thrive and create the thing that does not yet exist on the web, which is a vibrant intellectual culture that's driven by a desire to solve the problems of the 21st century. That's the job of a university. Uh, it's not enrolling 47,000 people in free courses. So uh, this is a second year graduate student in Comp Lit. And she decided that her way of interacting with this, she's working her way up to her orals, she began to write about the stuff she was thinking about online. It transformed her writing. It altered her project. It's live. She has an audience. I want to close with uh, two examples from that I got this semester. Give you a little bit of audio here. Novels, movies, and video games across the nation have embraced apocalyptic narratives in a unique manner using their settings to convey real post-9-11 fears gripping the nation. However, the one video uh, on the left about the pleasurable apocalypse was produced by a student in my large lecture class uh, for an extra credit assignment. I couldn't even begin to make something as sophisticated, I want to tell you. But it's available online. It's been watched uh, close to 200 times already a paper that a student did voluntarily. And it makes a, an extraordinary argument that, that is certainly is in mind, I've learned from it. And the argument is that, that what has changed about the apocalypse in the 21st century is that it has been turned into a, a desirable future, a commodity that's pleasurable and attractive. That's something to contend with. The uh, video on the right was made by a student who felt she had, to, well, didn't feel, had no experience making movies, videos. Um, and what I told the students in my burn seminar was, hey, you're on your own, man. You got a week. There are a billion videos out there. I think you can do it. And the result was extraordinary, uh, troubling because it's about the culture of cutting, which uh, happens among, uh, largely among teenage girls, but not exclusively. The images are very disturbing, and it's protected. Uh, there was an effort to remove these things from the web, and the people who cut it said that it was important to their self-representation to have access to this. What's striking to me is that Right now, it's unusual to get work of this caliber. It's not going to be for long. And one of the reasons why I'm very optimistic about the future here at Rutgers, one, uh, the powers that be have the wisdom to appoint uh, Jeff Longhofer to be in charge of the Clemente Center. He's an amazing man. And I think he's going to make certain that this center really does make a difference. And one of the ways that it can make a difference, if we simply think of the problem that lies ahead as helping students transition from home to school, we will have missed the point that school itself isn't what it used to be. So we need to have educators learn how to write with new media, think with new media, and dream with new media. We've got to learn how to do something other than say, turn off your cell phones. Okay. If we can't do it, how can we teach them to produce the intellectual culture of the future? So as I imagine the future for the Clemente Center, and uh, what I hope you will support in the years ahead as the center comes together, that it will be a space for research, scholarship, and teaching but that its focus will be on literacy, ethics, and creativity. If we do that, Tyler's death will not be in vain, and we will be in the process of making a better world. Thank you. <laughs>